Today, we are finishing up this mini-series entitled Signs of the Times. We've been looking at the final days, like what does it look like when the temple is going to be destroyed? That happened in 70 AD. And now we're going to look at what it looks like when Jesus gets ready to come back. And because that has not happened yet, that means we have some living to do between then and also now. So we're going to talk about how Jesus' return relates to us. And so there's been lots of talk about Jesus' second coming, lots of predictions. There's been lots of ideas about what was going to happen, when he was going to come. Some of you remember that some people even said that Jesus was going to come during the Y2K event that happened from 1999 to 2000. Well, Jesus hasn't come back, pointing to the fact that no one knows. No one knows. And so the best thing we can do is to be ready. And so in order to get ready, let's receive what Jesus said himself about his second coming. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me uh, to Mark chapter 13. Um, Open those up now if you would, and we're going to begin in verse number 24. If you need a copy of God's Word, put your hand up. Someone will get a Bible to you. Also, you're going to need your your sermon notes. You'll notice on your notes this week, there's a large area that's grayed out. That means if you don't know what that represents, it means you missed some stuff. You probably need to go back, listen to the first two sermons, get caught up, and then also work to apply this truth today. The last two weeks, we looked at the temple's destruction, what that meant in relation to the uh, children of Israel and their loss of loss of their place of worship. And this week, we're looking at what Jesus' return means to us. And the first thing Jesus says about his return is this. It says, verse 24, but in those days after the tribulation, Jesus is referring to the time period between when the temple was destroyed and his second coming. So that's 70 AD, so over 1,900 years ago, give or take a few years, to where his second coming is actually going to happen. He's talking about this, this, this period of tribulation mixed with the church age that's going to happen from 70 AD until he actually returns. And he's referring to after the city was seized and the temple was leveled. We saw that on last week. <clears throat> what news this would be to his disciples to know that after the tribulation, after the temple's destruction, that he's going to return He wants them to know that all hope is not going to be lost. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to come back. So don't worry. Don't get all worked up. There's going to be a time when I come back. And certainly hearing this news from Jesus himself, because in a few days he's about to be crucified, this would have been a bittersweet moment. Their Messiah, who they've been walking with for the past three years, is now going to be executed, essentially, and he's going to lead them, ascending back to glory. It would have been a time of great celebration, and also it would have been a bitter moment to know that your Messiah, your leader, your rabbi, is departing from you. Which, which those of us who are in Christ, we can relate to. We've watched the wanting destruction of everything that we love in our country, our community, our family, and even morality. Like the disciples, we're living through strange and confusing, dark times. We long for Jesus to come back and or to call us home, whichever comes first. And so in this way, we can relate to the disciples what it would have been like to know that their Messiah is leaving and then to live a life in, in anticipation for their Messiah to return. But unlike the disciples, we have no clue what it's like to actually know Jesus as the God-man. Because we were not around when Jesus walked on the face of the earth. So I'm sure his departure from them would have been especially painful for his disciples. And they would have been longing for him to return all the more. And so after telling his disciples uh, when to start expecting his return, Jesus goes on to describe what it's going to be like um, and the work that they should be doing in anticipation of his return, beginning with this. When Jesus returns, his entrance will be unmistakable and seen by everyone. When Jesus returns, his entrance will be unmistakable and seen by everyone. Look at the second part of verse 24. It says, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. Verse 25, and the stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. It's hard to imagine a day without sunlight. Or a night without the moonlight because the sun's rays are reflecting off the moon down to us. It's hard to imagine not having the stars spinning in the orbits in which they have been known to spin in. Maybe a comparison would be a total eclipse, right? We all know what this looks like. There's a certain time of the year when the the moon puts itself right in front of the sun. And pretty much the only thing you can see is the corona of the sun. That's the part we can see now shining around the outside of the moon. And the reason why that happens is because the sun is bigger than the moon. But even in a total eclipse, we can still see some light. But what's being described here is complete and total darkness. 
The sun is extinguished. Imagine the flame of a candle when you lick your fingers and you put it out. It's gone. It's dark. It says that the stars are going to fall out of their natural orbit. They're going to be falling down. There won't be any more Orion's Belt or the Milky Way or the Little Dipper or the Big Dipper or anything like that. They're all going to fall out of orbit. It's going to be complete darkness. There won't even be light enough to reflect off the moon to make its way to us. That's one of the ways people can try to describe what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. But it's not a good illustration because what's described here is complete and total darkness. When Jesus returns, there's no natural light emanating from any stars anywhere. And we know this because Jesus says the sun will be darkened meaning that it's going to be completely extinguished, void of light. And he continues and he goes on and says that the stars will fall from the sky. The stars will fall out of their natural orbits. And as a result, the powers in heaven, referring to our solar system, is going to be shaken. There's going to be chaos. In the skies, in, in outer space, Cosmic collisions are going to occur because orbits are going to be disrupted. One Bible scholar describes the event this way. He says, at the end of time, all such powers, real and also imagined, will be obliterated. The picture is one of total cosmic collapse. Darkness and chaos will envelop everything. Just as before the beginning of time began in Genesis 1-2, where it says the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. It was no light anywhere at the beginning of creation. This scholar is saying that's what it's going to be like. The earth will still be here, but there won't be any light whatsoever. The events that transpire before Jesus' return will be unlike anything that we've ever experienced in life. Unexplainable, yet remarkable. An event that will cause people to stop and take notice. Now, even the most godless atheist or the, morally, the most morally depraved person will be able to avoid, to see, be able to avoid what the, the, the stars falling from the sky are communicating. This event is all pointing to one thing, that King Jesus is here. Amen? It says, take notice that something out of this world is about to happen. Or should I say, take notice because someone out of this world has yet come. When Jesus returns, his his entrance will be unmistakable. That's number one. Second, when Jesus returns, all will know who he is and that he's now here. When he returns, all will know who he is and that he's now here. Look at verse 26 this time. It says, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. In the original language, which is Greek, the phrase they will are put together to form one word. And that word in the Greek is opsotai, opsotai, O-P-S-O-T-A-I, opsotai. And it's used to refer to a person's ability to perceive sight, to actually see, or to have the ability to see or to perceive. And in reference to people being able to see Jesus upon his return, what it means is that everyone is going to see Jesus for who he is. There won't be any mistaken regarding who he is. Is he just a good person? Is he a prophet? What's going on? Everyone is going to be able to see. He's going to be seen by both believers and non-believers, his friends and his enemies alike. They will see Jesus, the God-man, and will see him as he is for who he is. No one will be able to deny that Jesus is God. Isn't that interesting, though? When Jesus was on the earth, countless times people mistook who he was. Some say he's just a good teacher. Some said that he's a, he's, he's a great rabbi. Others said that he's just a good prophet. Others said he's the second coming of John the Baptist or Elijah. When this event happens and Jesus cracks the sky and comes down from heaven, no one is going to be able to mistake the fact that God is now here. And so the most hardest of heart atheists who believes in no God will say, oh, there is a God. The most depraved person who's been living how they want to live, foul and dirty, doing all sorts of things with their bodies against people will have to say, oh, but there is a God. I don't think that our ability or inability to see Jesus has anything to do with physical eyesight. After all, there were people who saw Jesus. He performed miracles. He healed some folks, and some folks refused to believe. I don't think it has anything to do with our our physical sight. 
but rather I think it has to do with our ability to see things spiritually. Taking, taking that into consideration, coupled with how Jesus returns, it describes, he's described as coming with great power and glory. I think this speaks to supernatural sight. And we tend not to give enough credit to the supernatural, but what you need to know about the supernatural is that th- that's referring to the spiritual realm. And that's the realm in which God moves in and out of. That's the realm in which God operates. And so if you want to talk about seeing Jesus and knowing Jesus, we've got to get down to the supernatural level or up to the supernatural level. I'll say it that way. And so a person's ability to see Jesus for who he is is made possible because no longer are there distractions. No longer is there light competing with him. No longer is there, is there a, a screen or a phone or something to look at to draw their attention away. Now their spiritual hearts can see that Jesus is God and they must profess that he is such because they're no longer distracted by stuff. Therefore, our spirit The immaterial part of us that makes us alive, I'm talking about our souls, which are eternal, they will see Jesus. Then our minds will process what they just saw, and together they will witness that God is now here. That will be for believer and unbeliever alike. And for those of us in Christ, Jesus' appearance will be a time of great joy and a sweet release from all pain, suffering, and sin's effects on us. And I say this based upon what happens next. Look at verse 27. What happens next is that all who belong to Jesus are gathered to him. All who belong to Jesus are gathered to him. Verse 27 this time, it says, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. We get to be with Jesus. We get to be with Jesus. We won't be left behind. I remember there was this TV show or a movie back in the day called the Left Behind series. We won't be left behind, but rather we are gathered. We are called up to be with Jesus in the heavens. Jesus is coming back to get his children. He's coming back to get his bride. Let that just soak in for a moment. Man, sometimes we, we know truth and we overlook truth. We heard it since we were kids in the church. But, man, this is an amazing opportunity to see Jesus in, as his loving Savior who collects, who gathers up all of his children to himself. Like a mama bird that says, don't step on my eggs. Those belong to me. Jesus is going to gather us to himself. I remember spending my summers in Lumberton, North Carolina with my granddad. Love my pops. I called him Pops. And I loved to be with him doing whatever he was doing. But my most favorite thing in the world was to go spend time with him on the tractor. Every time I heard the tractor fire up, I don't care if he was moving out of the shed or he was going to plow the field. I had to go be with my granddad because I love pops. But here's the thing, loved ones. That was a huge event for me. I wish I could do that with my granddad even now. But that joy that I had being with my granddad is going to pale in comparison to actually being with Jesus when he calls us, calls me to himself. As much as I enjoy that, it doesn't compare to Jesus. Here are three things to note regarding Jesus gathering people to himself. Number one, only the elect are gathered. Only the elect are gathered. Those who are graced to see Jesus as their Messiah and commit their lives to him, those are the ones who are going to be gathered. Jesus is going to gather both the dead and living saints, those who are physically dead, who are in the grave right now. He's going to gather those who are dead and those who are alive. He's going to resurrect them back to himself. No one will be left um, behind who believes in Jesus. Anyone who ever professed faith in Jesus Christ will be gathered unto him. Number two, God's church, the elect, will cover the globe. Having had its full and complete work. The gospel has done its job on a global level to the point where there are countless souls that need to be gathered. So many souls that the text says that Jesus is going to do what? How's he going to, how's he going to collect his souls? He's going to send out who? The angels to the four corners of the globe, all out over, over the heavens to gather people to himself. So what that points to, out to us is that the work that we're doing to witness Jesus Christ to, to people, it is being effective. More and more saints are being made, and the word of God is going out to more people who don't know who Jesus is. And so now he has his church that covers the entire globe, and he's going to gather all saints from everywhere from all times. That's a great time to say, amen, hallelujah. Because we tend to think that this world is getting darker, and it is. And we tend to think that the the gospel has been rendered ineffective. That's not true. 
We see here that there's lots of people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ because the gospel has gone out to the four corners of the globe. And I would argue, rather I would add that with the advent of internet and social media and texting and all of that, it's only expedited the process. Only expedited the process, making it easier. Just like Jesus said it would happen, he told his original 12 disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. Just like Jesus said it was, it was going to happen, it actually happened. And when Jesus referred to his disciples, telling them to go be my witnesses in Matthew 28, 19, be my witnesses all over the world, he, ta- he was talking about locally, nationally, and also the bordering countries, and also globally. Jesus fulfilled his mission through us. And now he has a global body of believers to collect, so numerous to gather that they're not even numbered. So many, in fact, that he dispatches his angels to retrieve us. You know what that says to us? It says that God has won. It says that God has won. And more than that, it says that we are on the winning team. Our faith in Jesus our devotion to Jesus, our commitment to living sanctified, set-apart lives was not in vain. Though people mocked and ridiculed us and made fun of us for being Christians, it was not in vain. Jesus is coming, and we get to go be with him. But, everybody say but. There's a question we have to address. If Christians are gathered to be with Jesus... What becomes of those who didn't put their faith in Jesus? What becomes of those people who are, quote, unquote, left behind? What's going to happen to them then? Well, I think the best way to start answering that question is looking at the various views regarding the millennium. And so I don't know how much you know about the millennium in times, the thousand-year reign and all of that. Um, This might be your first introduction, so I'm going to go slow. But the millennium is a reference to a thousand-year period that's going to occur after Jesus returns and calls his saints up to be with him. And so to aid you in understanding what the millennium is, I have it on the screen behind me, but I also gave you guys these handouts, right? It says the four views of the millennium. So historically... The church has held four distinct views views which have led to denominational splits and also the formation of new denominations. So hear me when I say this. It matters not what you believe about the millennium, whether it be in a literal thousand years or not. What matters is that you believe in Jesus Christ as the risen Savior, the Lord of your soul, okay? So this stuff is important. But if you die on this hill, you're dying in vain. If you get into arguments over the millennium, then you're arguing in vain, all right? So for context, the millennium is first talked about in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 5. And I would love for you guys to turn there and leave your Bibles open there. It's the last book in the, in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 5. I want you guys to see this for yourself, I'm not making this stuff up. All right. So the first view regarding the millennium is amillennialism, is amillennialism. These people, the ones who hold to this view, they deny the future millennium. They think that it's currently being fulfilled through the present age, which is the church age, the time between when Christ left and, where, and when he actually returns. In addition, they don't believe in the tribulation. They don't believe in the time of, ex- of extreme pain and evil and persecution of the saints that is spearheaded by the Antichrist, the evil one. And so these people deny that there's going to be a tribulation. Not only that, they believe that when Christ returns, he'll resurrect believers and non-believers. At that time, they will enter into their eternal state and non-believers will be judged into their eternal state. The second view is post-millennialism, post-millennialism. This is a belief that Jesus will return after the millennium is completed. Post-mills assume that as the gospel makes its way into the four corners of the globe, more and more people will get saved to the point where Christianity becomes this, this predominant religion in the world. And this world mag- the world magically becomes a safer, more loving, more godly place, a place that experiences unparalleled peace and prosperity. Post-millennials refer to this time period as the millennium. After a thousand years, Jesus is going to resurrect both believers and unbelievers. Each will receive their eternal rewards, after which God will make a new heaven and earth. 
And then there is the third view, which is the historic or classical premillennialism view. Like the first two, premillennials believe that they're currently living in the church age. But despite um, the faithful proclamation of the gospel, the world has gotten progressively worse, climaxing in what is referred to as the Great Tribulation. And that's what's being described in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 5. A time of great pain and misery for Christians and non-believers alike. And it all happens at the hand of the Antichrist. Jesus' sudden return ends the tribulation, at which time he gathers all believers from, from the ends of the world to himself, after which he will come down to inaugurate the millennial period, that thousand-year period of peace and prosperity, where he reigns in perfect righteousness. During this time, both non-believers and believers, they coexist. They live together side by side. And during this time, some will even put their faith in Jesus Christ, non-believers that is. After the millennium, Jesus resurrects the non-believers to be judged. And all who reject him as Messiah, the non-believers that is, they will enter into their eternal state, which we know to be as hell. The, that's the third view. And the fourth and final view is this, is the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view. They believe that the tribulation happens after Jesus, after Jesus gathers the believers up out of the world, kicking off a seven-year period of tribulation. So Jesus calls all the saints to be with him, and then he leaves those behind who don't believe in him by themselves. And during that time, the tribulation kicks off. This is made possible because the Lord's presence and his people have been removed from the world and this view comes with a nice sentiment because Christians, believers, are spared of the persecution that they would endure during the tribulation. Those are the four views of the millennium, which brings us full circle. Which is the most accurate? Of the four, I'd have to say that the historic premillennialism view is the most accurate for two reasons. Number one is this. You can't deny the fact that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 5, that it describes a separate and distinct period of time that occurs at the end of the tribulation. So that excludes amillennials and postmillennials. They, they believe in a literal tribulation. Number two, also you can't ignore the fact that pe the people described here in Revelation 20 are Christians who suffered at the hands of the great beast, the Antichrist. Yet despite suffering greatly, these individuals are referred to as holding fast to the faith. And so from this, we know that when Jesus returns, it will be a time of jubilee, a time of great celebration because the bride, which is us, the church, is reunited with her groom, who is Jesus Christ, signifying that the war is over and that Jesus has won. So what becomes of nonbelievers when Jesus returns for his millennial reign? Now that their spiritual eyes have been opened to see Jesus for who he is and what he is, he is God, he is their Messiah, now that they've had yet another thousand years, give or take a few, to put their faith in him, what is going to happen to them? When Jesus returns at the end of the millennium, those individuals will be judged and cast into hell. Those who refuse to put their faith in him. Upon reading our sermon text and learning about the four views of the millennium, we can't help but fall in love with Jesus all over again. Look at his compassion for sinners. Despite these people choosing to take an active stance against him during his millennial reign, despite the fact that these people sided with the Antichrist against Jesus, he gives them yet another opportunity to believe in him, to see him as their Messiah. Non-believers get this second chance. No one will be, ever be able to say, God, you didn't give me a chance to believe. God, you didn't show yourself to me. You didn't reach down and try to save me. Next. We find ourselves in verse 32, don't we? And those of you who are following me, you're like, hey, you skipped over some verses, Pastor. I certainly did. And the reason I did that was because we learned on last week, but that was, a, that was a parable that Jesus tied to the temple's destruction and the abomination of desolation when he talked about that on last week. And so we're going to fast forward over that to verse 32 where we pick up. Here Jesus is addressing the timing of his return. He wants his readers to know, to know this that there will be no warning when Jesus returns, so be on the lookout. There's not going to be a warning. There's not going to be a, hey, you got five minutes. Hey, you got another week. 
There's, going, there's not going to be a warning that Jesus returns, so be on the lookout. You can say, keep your head on the swivel, because he's not going to warn people. Stay well. <laughs> Derek said, stay well. I feel you. 32. He says, now concerning that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor, check this out, check this out, the Son of Man or, or Jesus himself. Not even Jesus knows, but he says, but the Father does. Jesus is saying the precise date and time has not been released for anyone to know. But there's one person who knows, God the Father, he knows. He's already determined the exact time, but he's chosen not to share that. It's classified information that is to be released on a need-to-know basis. And Jesus doesn't need to know, neither do the angels need to know, nor his disciples need to know. Jesus tells his disciples that not even his angels need to know. And it makes sense to us because the angels were designed and created by God to serve his will, so they wouldn't be in on the decision-making process. But when Jesus says nor the son referring to himself, we have to pause and ask ourselves what's going on here. If Jesus is God, if he's the second person of the Trinity, why would Jesus say that he doesn't even know the time, the day, nor the hour? Why does he say only God the Father knows? Isn't he co-equal with God the Father? Isn't he co-equal with God the Holy Spirit? And the answer is 100% yes. But it helps to remind ourselves that that this is God in the flesh. This is not Jesus in heaven, but this is Jesus down on earth with them. And that each person of the Trinity, yes, they're one, but they have distinct roles within within the Godhead. And Jesus' role is to serve the Father's will perfectly, which in this case was to come to earth to atone for our sins. And so if we look at Philippians 2, 5 through 8, I think we get some light shed on this, this issue that we're looking at right now. Jesus, well, not Jesus, but the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians. He says, Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, putting on flesh. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When Jesus became a man, what Paul is saying is that he abstained from using all of his divine abilities. He he abstained from sharing in all of his divine attributes so that he can completely embody what it meant to be a man. And he submitted to the Father's will perfectly, thus being our example. Therefore, Jesus is able to say only the Father knows when it's his turn to come back because he's serving the Father's will. And that date and that time was not for Jesus to know. Therefore, Jesus can say that he hid that information from himself. I know we don't fully get that, but that we're going, those was one of those things we're probably going to figure out and have more clarity and glory. All we know is that Jesus says it's not for him to know, and as he's serving the Father will, then we have to take him at his word. Amen? Amen. Although Jesus himself says only the Father knows, it hasn't deterred a great many from claiming to know when Jesus is going to come back. How spiritually blind, how biblically illiterate, how full of yourself do you have to be to claim to know what Jesus denied himself from knowing? And God, in his infinite wisdom, has chosen to conceal the date from us. Instead of wasting our time to predict the date and the the time and all that type of stuff, I think we should do what Jesus says do in verse 33. He says, watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. Watch, be alert. You don't know. Between then, which is 33 AD, that's the year he died, and when he actually returns, the best thing we can do is to watch and to be alert. And I want to give you four reasons why we need to watch and be alert. Number one, you need to watch and be alert because deceivers will come and attempt to lure you away from the faith. Deceivers will come and try to lure you away, draw you away from the Christian faith. Jesus knew that as time progressed, After his exaltation back to glory, his disciples might begin to lose some of their fire, and they might even drop their guard, open themselves up to the wrong types of people, the wrong types of teaching. It's human nature to doubt, loved ones. But when doubt goes unchecked, we can find ourselves looking for ways to reassure ourselves. For some, that means looking outside of the household of faith, commingling their Christian values and their Christian faith with other religions. 
For others, that means following church leaders or religious leaders as if they're God in the flesh. And for others, that means dropping the Christian faith altogether in pursuit of humanism, a belief that all the answers to life and complete happiness can be found within oneself. Loved ones, Jesus says to be alert against doubt. Those are dangerous emotions that if we leave them unchecked can woo us away from Jesus Christ. When you sense doubt, how about you reinforce your faith with God's word? How about you spend some meaningful time in prayer? Lord, I'm struggling today. I haven't seen you. I haven't heard you. I am bugging out. Lord, would you restore me today? Would you renew my faith in you today? How about reaching out to your church, fellow church members, for prayer and for support. Last week in Bridge Group, we talked about carrying one another's burdens and accountability. And when we're struggling, one of the things we can do as Bridge Group members is to bolster each other, to, to uplift each other. And so doubt becomes a thing that's not even an issue for us when we practice those things. It's human nature to doubt, but don't let doubt take root in your heart because you will get wooed away. Next, keep watch. You have work to do until Jesus returns. Keep watch because you have work to do until Jesus returns. And there's three things we need to be about doing always until Jesus returns and relieves us of that duty. Number one, we need to submit to the Lord's transformative work. Romans 12, 1 through 2 talks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Not the world, but by the renewing of our minds, by the washing of God's word. We need to submit to that transformative work. I think I heard Michael say in a prayer earlier, Lord, allow your word to chisel away at us. We don't like to change you. We don't like to be changed. We like the way that we are. And so God's word has this amazing ability to work on who we are and reshape us into the image that God wants us to be where we think more like Jesus and we love more like Jesus and we behave more like Jesus and we treat people the way Jesus treated people. But if you don't submit to the transformative work of God's word, you're going to remain the same. That's our first job, to be transformed through the Lord's word working on us. Number two, we are responsible to grow the Lord's kingdom. We are responsible to make new disciples. Talking about the gospel making its way to the four corners of the globe and all these gajillions of, of saints being made, that happens as we share the gospel. Where do I get that from? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus commanded his disciples to make more disciples that make more disciples. And that same commission and that same command is ours to uphold. That's why we keep it on the wall. It's part of our mission. We witness Jesus to non-believers. And finally, we're also to help each other grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. We're to help new believers take their next steps in Jesus Christ. That includes helping them to get baptized, teaching them what it means to be a disciple, walking with them through God's word, encouraging them along the way, and teaching them how to pray. We're to help one another because we are responsible to help each other. So it's not just make new disciples, but it's walking alongside of that sister or brother who just put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's a both and. You guys, that makes sense, right? That's the work. Those are the work we're supposed to be about doing, submitting to the Lord's transformative work, growing the Lord's kingdom, and helping others grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. Here's another warning. We need to keep watch to keep from getting caught lacking. We need to keep watch to keep from getting caught lacking because there is no way of knowing when Jesus' second coming is going to happen. We need to be alert lest we get caught unprepared when he actually returns. I don't know if you ever did this. I'm telling myself. There was a time when my parents went out of town. I knew how long they were going to be out of town. You know what I did while they were gone? Party. I threw a house party. Have you ever seen kid play house party movie back in the 90s or 80s, whenever it was? I lived it up. My sister locked herself in the room because she didn't want no parts of it. But, man, I invited everyone over. We were just having fun until I got caught because my parents came back early. I got caught lacking. We need to keep watch so we don't get caught lacking. Jesus isn't trying to hear us say, but, Lord, we didn't know. Or, Lord, give us five more minutes. Or, Lord, can you hit the snooze button? Jesus isn't trying to hear that. It says that his appearance is going to be sudden. It's not going to have, you're not going to have any time to pack your bags, no time to evangelize the lost, no time to finally crack open your Bibles and, and read that Bible passage that you've been meaning to read. He's going to call us up to be with him instantly. And so at that time, all work is going to cease. And you won't have time to add more work or to add more works to, to, to your credit. Because according to Romans 2, 6, at the appointed time, Jesus will repay each of us according to our works. See, some of us don't understand this, 
But the work that we do here in the here and now, it earns us a greater and greater reward in glory. I don't know all the details of what the reward is going to be like, but there's additional reward beyond salvation that we receive in glory based upon how we live and the works we did in the here and now. And so that time when Jesus was like, go evangelize that brother. When that time when Jesus was like, go be nice to that sister. She needs a friend. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. Or that time when Jesus was like, learn all you can about me. Read the New Testament in one year. You're like, no, I don't want to do that. You are robbing yourself of the opportunity to gain greater and greater rewards and glory. And here's the motivation. The motivation isn't the rewards. It's not the, that's not the motivation because you're already in glory. The motivation is knowing that you please your heavenly father Amen. and that he's pleased with you. That's the motivation. And so we need to be on watch to keep from getting caught lacking. That's number three. Here's the fourth reason to keep from falling victim to boredom, to keep from falling victim to boredom. When you, don't know when, when you don't know when something is going to happen, you tend to stay prepared because you don't want to get caught lacking. Jesus drives home this idea through a well-placed parable. Let's read it together, verse 34. Jesus says the, ti- the timing of Jesus' return is like, and here's his parable, is like a man on a journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, gave each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, Jesus says, be alert. Since you don't know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at the the crowing of the rooster or early in the morning, otherwise when he comes suddenly, he might find you what? Sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. In this parable, the homeowner who went on a journey is no one other than Jesus Christ himself. And as you know, he's currently in heaven serving the Father's will, awaiting his time to return to us. The servant and the doorkeeper are one and the same. That represents us. And as doorkeepers, we're responsible for keeping guard against the Christian doctrine and to make sure that false teachers don't make their ways into the church. And as, and as a servant's owners, we're responsible to serve the Lord's will perfectly. Now that Jesus is gone, now that he's away on his journey back to glory, He's left us in charge, and we're to be about serving him and gatekeeping until he returns. Boredom is bad because unless we nip it in the bud, we can find ourselves doing things we have no business doing just to entertain ourselves. If we're not careful, boredom can distract us away from the main thing. And when that happens, when we are busy looking at stuff that is on the periphery, that's not important, that's not the main thing, we can allow all types of the wrong people to make their way into the church house. I'm talking about false teachers and and prophets, divisive church members and corrupt leaders. They can find their way into the church where they pervert God's word, where they molest his people and sin runs rampant and the church looks more like a frat house than like a place of worship. And ultimately, God is robbed of his glory That's what happens when the church gets bored with being the church. And we take our attention off of the the Lord's work, and we put on some other stuff. When we fall asleep at the will, so to speak, Jesus says to his bouncers, he says to his gatekeepers and his servants, he says, you need to be alert Leaders and lay members alike, we have a job to do that requires our full attention. So keep your eyes peeled. Stay alert. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus visited the churches here in America and performed, I don't know, a spot inspection, so to speak, what would he find? Deeper yet, what if Jesus determined who would get to go with him based upon what he found in the churches? How many do you think would actually be allowed to go with him? How many do you think he would actually gather to himself? I wish I could say that every church building in America would be completely empty if Jesus was to come back today. But that wouldn't be true. Sadly, we know this certainly wouldn't be the case because not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, who goes by the name Christian, who goes by the name Christian, truly belongs to the Lord. And the reason for that is because we've fallen asleep. We've let people become church members in our churches who don't know Jesus, some of which are actively working to destroy the church from within. We've chosen size and popularity in place of making healthy disciples. Just so we're on the same page, when I say the word church, I'm talking about Big C Church. It's a collection of Jesus followers from all generations across the globe. 
the local church or little c church is a reference to the collection of followers that are committed to serving his will in a local community. What makes a church a church is their collective belief and devotion to God through Jesus Christ. What makes a Christian a Christian is your personal belief and devotion to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we say the word church, we're talking about all blood-bought, faith-professing, Christ-committed people. And so when I say that we fall asleep, it's in reference to allowing non-Christians to identify as Christians through church membership. And when that happens, the church is diluted. Non-believers are made to believe that they're saved when they're not. And God's glory is no longer the focal point of the church. So in the words of Jesus Christ, who bled and died for his church, who is coming back for his church, be alert. Stay awake. Let this be a wake-up call for some of you and a source of encouragement to others. I remember back in the day, we used to sing this song, Soon and Very Soon, some of y'all remember that song, right? I'm not going to sing. I'm not a singer. But some of the lyrics went, soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Soon and soon we're going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We're going to see the king. I didn't fully understand it when I was a little kid going to church. But now that I'm older, having gone through some stuff and processed through this, this scripture, thinking about Jesus' second coming, his, this, that song, it means so much more to me. Because soon and very soon, the king is coming to us, and we will see him, and we won't experience any more pain, any more suffering. Therefore, I pray that we would have a renewed sense of urgency and anticipation for Jesus' return. Loved ones, the signs of the times are telling us that we are living in the last days. I'm not going to say it's another 100 years, another five years. I don't know when the Jesus is going to return. All I know is that we're living in the last days, and that started when Jesus departed this earth and went back to glory. And if we're not ready in the tribulation, if we're not already, I'm sorry, if we're not already in the tribulation, then we're pretty close to it. Therefore, we need to hunker down and take our faith more seriously. We need to take Jesus' command to be alert and to be watchful because soon and very soon the king will be here and we don't want to be found lacking. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory. We thank you, Lord, that um, you don't say sorry for anything in your word and you're very clear in what you have to say and you're very clear in what you expect us to do with what you said. Lord, we call ourselves the church because we put our faith in you. Yet, Lord, we know that all of us have work to do in anticipation of your return. Lord, the signs of the times are pointing to your imminent return. And, Lord, we may not know the day, the time, nor the hour. We do know that we have work to do. Lord, let us not busy ourselves, but let us ded dedicate ourselves to the work we're supposed to be about doing for the edu edification of ourselves, for the good of our fellow man, and for your glory. Let us be about that work. Lord, forgive us when we've become bored and done things and engaged in things that have nothing to do with our spiritual growth and the upbuilding of your church. Lord, let this be a time to recommit ourselves to the work you called us to do. And Lord, for those of us who have a heavy heart on this morning, feeling like all hope is lost, like there's no future for me, let them take solace in knowing that you're coming back to get them. If they put their faith in you, you're coming back to get them. They will not be left behind. Therefore, Lord, they have something to look forward to. In fact, all of us who have put our faith in you, we have something to look forward to. Thank you, Jesus, for that gift, the gift of faith, the gift of hope. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you more on today than we did on yesterday. To you be the glory. And now, Lord, as we get ready to stand and sing praises to your name, let us sing with renewed passion, a renewed commitment, and increased vigor. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, please receive our prayer.